wonderful speakers with us here tonight. Uh, right there, Mara Nisimol, Angelica Clark. It's uh, going to be a really good discussion, and we'll start out with each of them talking for about 15 minutes about uh, intersectionality. And what that means. Mara's going to give us a little definition of what it, what it is. And um, as she pointed out, it would probably take an entire semester in college to really define it. But um, she's going to give it a go. So we'll go ahead and get started. And then after they've each had a chance to speak, they'll take questions and we'll have discussion. Hi, um, my name is Mari. And um, so, yeah, like Tree said, basically intersectionality can mean a lot of different things. Um, I'm going to use it uh, in two ways. The first way is to refer to um, how, for a lot of people, um, they identify as being oppressed not just by one single system, but by multiple systems. So for example, um, a black woman who identifies as queer is going to have to face oppression from sexism, patriarchy, racism, homophobia, multiple different um, you know, systems of oppression. And um, a recent example of uh, someone who doesn't really understand this concept um, was Patricia Arquette when she gave her um, acceptance speech at the Oscars um, when she was talking about women receiving you know, equal pay and you know, equal rights. That was a really good, you know, important thing to talk about. But I want to read a quote from her where she said, it's time for all the women in America and all the men that love women and all the gay people and all the people of color that we fought for to fight for us now. And I'm sure she had really good intentions, but that statement is really problematic because it was implying that the only people who've been fighting for women were white women who are straight. Like to say that it's time for people of color and for gay people to start fighting for women's rights is to imply that there haven't been, you know, decades of women of color and women um, who identify as gay or queer who have also been fighting for the rights of women. Um, so I think it's really important to recognize that just because a certain group may not look or live like you doesn't mean that they're not also fighting for the same things or even fighting for your rights. Um, so. Uh, Audre Lorde said that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't lead single issue lives. And a lot, we all as activists usually have like one or two issues that are the most important to us that we focus the majority of our attention and our efforts on. Um, but intersectionality kind of helps us realize that some of these issues, you know, we may frame as <coughs> anti-war or environmental or, you know, anti-racism, but they really actually um, can be applied in a much broader spectrum. And there's a lot of connections that can be made with other groups and other activists who may, on the surface, appear to be focusing on different things. Um, so, a couple examples I would like to use are on. Um, you know, a lot of us, you know, may focus either on stuff that happens domestically or stuff that happens overseas. But a lot of these issues actually have really strong connections, um, you know, domestically and foreign. So over the summer, I'm sure everybody here knows about what happened in Ferguson. Um, and one of the big things that we saw was police being very violent, using weapons, using tear gas against unarmed protesters. And I would like to make the connection between some of the um, you know, military reactions on the part of the US police and connect that to the fact that these same companies that supply tear gas to the Ferguson Police Department, they also supply tear gas to the regime in Bahrain who uses tear gas against peaceful protesters there and to the um, Israeli occupation who uses tear gas against Palestinians and you actually have activists in these Middle Eastern countries reaching out to Ferguson and saying, you know, we realize that, you know, we're going through different struggles, but at the same time, we're facing some of the same things. Like, we get hit with tear gas, too, and this is what you should do to help, you know, your eyes not burn, and this is what you should do to make sure that you don't get, you know, um, too sick from breathing this in. And so it's like making connections like that 
between people we might not automatically identify with. But if you, you know, just like look beneath the surface a little bit or try to reach out to some of these people, the connections are definitely there. Um, or another example that I just kind of recently became aware of is there's uh, an Israeli uh, military and weapons manufacturing company called Elbit Systems, who manufactures and plays a big role on, in the military operations in the Palestinian territories. But they've also been signing contracts with uh, the Department of Homeland Security and our government to start militarizing the U.S.-Mexico border. So um, in some of these instances of oppression, it's not just the governments of certain countries that are, you know, the U.S. government supporting, you know, police violence here and then also in countries overseas, but also some of these um, international corporations are, again, targeting Americans and they're also targeting you know, innocent people in other countries. Um, so another um, example, I personally, I focus a lot on the whole issue of Israel and Palestine, so I kind of use that to illustrate a lot of examples. Um, <coughs> another recent example was uh, there was a Mexican farm worker in Washington State named Antonio Zambrano Montes, who was throwing rocks um, you know, in the street and threw some rocks at a police officer and got shot multiple times and killed. Didn't have a gun, didn't have a weapon, but he was throwing rocks. And again, that's something that happens all the time in Palestine. You know, even kids get sentenced to like six months in jail for throwing rocks. And so it's just like we see this extreme overreaction on the part of security forces and police forces against unarmed people or people who, you know, may have been doing something questionable but definitely did not deserve, you know, to be killed over it. Um, and so I think it's really important to realize that it's not just us that these things are happening to and it's not just the Palestinians that these things are happening to. It's, you know, we're all kind of being targeted by the same, like, extreme militaristic mindset. Um, of the state security systems. And uh, the other thing I want to touch on is just this concept of the dehumanization of the other, um, where the you know systems of power and oppression really try to influence public opinion to see certain groups of um, you know minorities or people of certain beliefs as more inclined to be violent or you know, uh, criminal. So when we have um, teenage black men in America, um, you know, just walking through the streets or, you know, just in their own neighborhoods, there's a tendency for police and for society in general to be like, oh, well, this is a young black man. He's probably a thug. He's probably a criminal or a drug dealer, up to no good, a gang member. And that makes it very much more likely to be targeted for you know, violent policing, overreaction, you know, he reaches into his pocket, oh, he must have a gun, and the next thing you know, it's another unarmed person getting killed. And at the same time, we have the US military in a country like Yemen, where any teenage man, who, you know, Arab man, <coughs> is considered to automatically be a militant. And so that means that they can be targeted for detention or interrogation, rendition, obviously drone strikes. And so at, while you know there's obviously big differences between police officers in America and the US military overseas, it really comes down to just like the labeling and overgeneralization of an entire demographic group as a means of using it as like an excuse to violate their human rights and their civil rights um, and perpetuate these acts of violence against them with no accountability whatsoever. Um, and like in the same kind of uh, you know area, we also see like blaming of the victim instead of holding the you know oppressors and the systems of power accountable. Um, you know, we have something like again with drone strikes when Abdul Rahman Alaki, a 16-year-old American citizen, was killed by a drone in Yemen when one of the few journalists who actually confronted the Obama administration about this asked them why this happened. Their response was, well, he should have had a more responsible father. So, um, you know, over the summer, a 12-year-old named Tamir Rice 
was shot and killed in Cleveland because he was on a playground playing with a pellet gun. And when this happened, um, you know, the city of Cleveland basically said, and this actually, this statement just came out, you know, within the past week or two, well, you know, he should have been playing with a toy gun. And so it's all especially ironic because in this particular state, like they have open carry laws. So white people walk around with real guns all the time and don't have any problem. But a young 12-year-old little boy was playing with a fake gun and he got killed for it. And so instead of the people who perpetrate these unexcusable acts of violence being held accountable, and at the very least owning up to the fact that there's something wrong, they just completely disregard the life of the person that they just took and try to make it seem like that person deserved to die. Um, and so again, obviously there's very big differences between these two cases, but at the same time, there's also a lot of like really disturbing similarities. And I think that one of the things about intersectionality that's most important is while we always need to acknowledge the differences and the nuances that make our struggles different, it's important to realize the connections and always be looking for ways to build on those connections because at the end of the day, a lot of the systems of oppression and suffering really are caused by the same basic kinds of things, just disregard for human life, disregard for people who look or think or believe in things that are different than us, um, especially you know people who aren't white, people who don't have um, a lot of economic resources, um, people who are the most vulnerable. I think that um, intersectionality really just comes down to finding ways that we can all um, you know, use our similarities to strengthen and learn from each other and build uh, stronger movements. Um, so, one last thing I just also like to, you know, remind everybody is that when we are looking to reach out to other activists and other movements, it's always really important to give priority and respect to the wishes of those that we're trying to help. So instead of coming in and being like, hey, okay, I have an idea and this is how we're gonna save you guys and I think we should do this, this, and this, it's really important to engage in dialogue and actually you know, let these people be the leaders of their own movement and ask them, what can I do to help you? And if you have an idea, like I'm not saying you shouldn't you know, contribute your idea, but it's always really important to kind of let them remain in the lead. So if you're a white person attending a Black Lives Matter rally, it's really important instead of coming in and be like, oh, I think we should do this, it's important to listen to the black people there. And when the media comes, instead of being like, oh, I want to talk about this, you should let a black person talk about this because they're the ones who are being the most targeted and the most oppressed. Um, so thank you. which I'm talking about two different subjects and trying to try to connect and connect different things and others. Trying to decide which one I was going to talk about first. Um, but Mari just gave me a great segue because I'm actually trying to set up a forum. One of the areas, you know, I'm an environmentalist and I was going, I'm trying to set up a forum down in Corning, New York for, because they have um, waste coming in from Pennsylvania. Um, we, we're getting 30% of the frack waste from Pennsylvania, and it's going to really poor areas. And I've been trying, the hill that I used to ride the bus on to work, in fact, I'm going to open up this part, I'll be sniffing around on it, but I'm gonna, I've got some pictures and stuff, so. Um, what happens here? Uh, what do I, what do I work with? Do I think? No, what? So, I grew up in Painted Coast. You can go up to view and do a full screen if you want to. Um, no, not yet, because I'm going to be able to find the slides over here. Mm -hmm. well, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. So, um, Manning Ridge Road is, which is right here, was my favorite bus ride as a kid. It was a great, it's beautiful, beautiful view. There was a really, I think it was probably an elm. I was little. And there was a big, huge tree that I used to see right over here on this ridge. 
This actually goes way down. This is like a ridge, and this is coming down to a valley, and there's a broad hollow trick right there. Um, as I talk about painting post, like my language gets more and more ahead, because that's something that I hit you up. But um, the, the third way is I'm forming a form. I've been trying for years, years to get people who live near the Hague's landfill to come out and to talk about, you know, trying to find people and trying to get them to do something. And I finally found a woman a year ago who we've been talking about it. We've been talking about how, you know, because they're getting sick. Um, and this, and so I tried to set up this forum for them, and I'll get into more about that. But this is the segue. And these other people I know who are all about decolonizing everybody and getting radical movements going, and, and I am too. But they want to do it, they want to kind of, these are my friends, these are the people I work with, and they kind of want to co-opt this whole thing that I'm just trying to get these people together to start talking. I want the conversation to start with these people who are being impacted. And there's three different waste dumps in this area. Um, in this, um, the Highland landfill, which is in Allegheny County, the Hakes landfill, which is the one I just showed you, and the Shimon County landfill. And each one of these, the people who live there are dirt poor. It's a very white area, but it's dirt poor. They're the Appalachia classified as Appalachia by the federal government. And there's a lot of poor people. I mean, in, in the heart of some of the, the Shimon County landfill is in Laumen, and there is an activist group of locals. And I mean, it got, this one guy's got so much heart, he lives like so close to it. And he built this big fake machine that's called the stinker meter. And it's got like a little lever on it and it shows what degree it stinks. But, yeah, and this is, I'm not even sure how this is an intersection, but I'm kind of, this is, um, all of these landfills are run by Casella. And Casella was one of the big New York families. So this is how the big, new, some, one of the big New York families is trying to clean up their act, is by running the waste in New York State and elsewhere. They, they're, um, they've also got a huge place, I think they're connected with the Waterloo landfill, which is the biggest landfill in New York State. It's actually used to be a flat plain, flat field, and it's now basically a hill. I mean, it's literally, like, high. And um, so, but the, the thing with the poverty is that they don't care. And in the same area, and it's still kind of connected, is, um, about water withdrawals, I think that's going to another issue about water sales. Because New York State has some of the biggest quantities of pure water, drinkable water, in the world. And only a third of the people in the world, I mean, a, a third of the people in the world do not have potable water. <coughs> and only 1% of the water left in the world is potable. So, I mean, it's really getting down there. So I think that this is going down to something about using where this country, and it's about time for us, where, where this country is becoming a resource colony for a lot of different things, and not just for the oil, and not just for the gas, but also for the water. Um, and I'm sorry I'm jumping all around here. I'm trying to think about how to... Uh, so the painted... This is my brother, Michael. The painted post, this man here... Shoot, how do I go back? Oh, yeah. 
button you press your arrow button. See your, your arrow buttons to go back on the bottom of your thing? There we go. So this man on the left, the man holding the little dog, this is another case of an intersectionality. It's, it's, it's the justice system. And it's something for everybody to kind of watch out for. It's something that everybody's being attacked by the justice system. One thing they're going against, we won the painted post water withdrawal lawsuit against Shell. Against Shell. Big, we won a lawsuit against Shell because they were withdrawing water without being environmentally conscious. But this, the thing about this guy over here on the left, he lives a stone's throw from where they're withdrawing the water, which is where the old train is and everything else. That's the water withdrawal pipes. They're drawing water out of an old ground field in fact. And he lives a stone's throw away. Well, the judge, uh, when, they, when we lost the appeal, he um, basically said that this man here didn't have any standing. This man here is standing perfectly fine in my eyes. He doesn't have any standing because the judge apparently probably got money to say he doesn't have any standing. He's a poor guy. He's a working guy. I mean, he worked all his life. He's now retired with a very sick wife, which was part of his um, thing about being in a lawsuit. And it's, but it's, it's standing and if you're in any kind of lawsuits, the justice system is as corrupt as any other system. I mean, there are ways, we're going to the New York State Court of Appeals with this, which is the highest court, and I'm hopeful, but it could all fall apart, I, I answer that. Um, so standing of people in court, if you don't have the money, if you don't have the lawyers, if you don't have it, don't just say you don't have standing, and you could be have the, you know, he could live right where, they could have one of these water pumps going into his belly and they could say you don't have any standing. So um, it's another place where I think you uh, got to be careful. I do want to show you, how do I get out of this now? Uh, uh, Precious State, 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 so um, I'm going to come back to this. I want to. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, I'm really sorry. If my if my um, if I I lost my connection for my computer. I, so I have, I'm, it's the Alice Brody conflict. I don't have the connection to my MacBook, so I'm going to get a regular uh, computer here. Um, I wanted to show you this map because it it's shows all the different places where, you know, New York State is being impacted. And one place that I don't know if people even know is the Ned Pipeline, which is going to be going right here to Delmar. Um, or it's New Scotland, and it's a pipeline that's going to take all the crude oil out of, um, or all the natural gas out of this country and move it to export. But they're going to be putting a 90,000 horsepower compressor station in Nassau, um, in Mexico County. And the mini sink is 12,000, and I was down there, and I was an eighth of a mile from that, my eyes were, uh, were really stinging. And I started to talk, and my one friend Billy was getting sick. So 90,000 is this. Um, <coughs> this. I just want you to look at this because each one of these different things is how all of the power stuff going on in this in this state is still going on. It's not including the um, not I, the bomb trains aren't on here, and that's still another whole other thing. And that's something else that goes into, I'm going to segue away from this whole thing and get into education. But I'm going to use my last couple of slides here to do that. Oh, can I close the other one out, please? Um, so the last two couple of slides here, I love this slide because we had Make Greg McFarland, we had a cop car right there. This is Sam Seabrook. He's a great guy, runs radio, on the little time radio station, and does a whole lot of stuff. Keeps trying to fight everything down in Athens. Athens um, compressor station and Athens Gen. Athens Gen is run by PS&G, 
which is another big power company. But the thing is, see, all of this is in my school district. All the parents are connected to all of this infrastructure going on down there. So I have to constantly be careful. It's another way I'm being impressed in school because all of these people really want to get it. And they really want the power. And they really think this is all good for them. What's going on in the education system, and we were talking about how, you know, Cookstocky is a really strange place. You've got Athens, it's got the power generating plant, they've got a compressor station, an airport compressor station. They've got bomb trains going through all, all the time. The bomb train is an eighth of a mile from my school. So now we've got the whistles blowing. And I asked, I surveyed the school, uh, the teachers, and about one in three even knew of the existence of bomb trains. One in two, or uh, one in two saw the news about the West Virginia explosions, but the people there, they just don't even know because the teachers are exhausted. I mean, it's just been worn out and it's all part of trying, they really are trying to destroy the school system and I honestly think that my district is a petri dish. It's a petri dish to try to destroy us so that they can bring in charter schools. We have somebody from Peck Valley coming and teaching us computer uh, curriculum leaders, most of us who have been teaching more than 20 years, how to teach the way that they teach. Now that school is not that successful. It's a charter school, and they're trying to get us to do it their way, probably to justify their existence. Their testing, the testing is out of sight. It's just they want to test everything. It's not so bad in the high school. The high school's always had testing, but now they want us to do other tests. But the main thing is this uh, um, evaluation. They're watching us all the time. It's in the APPR, which is how they evaluate us. Used to be the principal would walk in, he'd write down stuff, he'd have a really good talk, he'd say things. Now, before you get evaluated, you have to spend like two hours filling out one form, make an appointment to go see the principal, talk to the principal about this form for 45 minutes, then go back and readjust and rewrite, read what he says for another couple of hours. And this is twice a year that you have to go through this process. Then after you've been evaluated and you've sat down with him, you have to write all this stuff that you agree with or didn't agree with, which a lot of it is just plain old BS. And teachers are exhausted. They're really exhausted and they feel, you know, when our new principal came in, he says there's no joie here, there's no joy at all in the school district. We're just totally, I mean, it really is oppressive. Um, and, you know, the kids, they keep saying, we well, let the kids teach. The kids should be teaching themselves. They are trying to destroy the kids' ability to learn. It's another intersectionality. The school district, and the thing with Koksaki, and part of the reason why I think it's a touch of this, there's two prisons in Koksaki. There's a prison right on the other side of the bound train tracks from the school system. And these two prisons, um, it's not the prisoners that I'm worried about, it's that all of these kids, their parents are prison guards. And they, so they have very conservative mindset, a very, there's some racist mindset. The, the school district has been gaining some people to try to fraud and cheer because when I first worked there, there was maybe one person of color <coughs> that in high school. Now it's, it's, it's getting up there to like the national levels, but it's still with this insidious racism. Um, and it's, it's um, and I think that the time they they just want to destroy us to make money on the testing and to also to make, I really do think they want to dull us down. They don't want people questioning. They don't want people knowing what's going on. They want to have a multi-tiered system. They want to have so many kids learn how to push buttons, how to play games, how to, and, and that's about it. Um, I'm not sure if I hit on intersectionality. I'm not sure if I hit on, um, but there's, if we're going, I'm doing one, one last section, one slide here, then I'm going to do another one. And then I'm going to do another one.
I want to do this. Um, and it has to do with the stump expansion, but it's also, how do I make this big? Okay, the county legislatures, or the Shimon County legislature, which is where the one, the Laman dump is, have permitted dump expansions um, and for PA exactly. The people were going there, the four people were going there every single month going to the county legislature. There's all kinds of, all kinds of expansions. And they were all listening very, very, very smartly. And people were honestly thinking that they were getting something. It's kind of like the people who were going to, you know, who go to some hearings or whatever and think that they're getting someplace. After a year, a very polite, this is happening, my wife has got cancer, it's directly related to this. After a year, they just voted for the extension. It's, it's, they said they're getting money. Um, it's a new low in our so-called democracy. We, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about the lawsuits. It doesn't matter about going to hearings. It doesn't matter that the regulatory system is the laws, the regulatory laws are written by industries. Um, and, all of, and all of the laws are written by industries. The educational laws are written by the profiteers. They're not written by educators. They're written by Bill Gates and his, and his friends. They get in there. Um, and. Um, until we understand how and why this is happening, until we challenge laws written by corporations passed by compliant, compliant legislators and enforced by regulatory agencies and other agencies, all the governmental agencies, we'll have no democracy. And democracy is what we have to fight for. We have to stop asking. We have to start demanding. We have to realize that everything they're saying is to one goal, and that is for their power and their profit. And that's what we have to start fighting, and that's the interconnected system. When they're destroying these people, when they're destroying what, what they want in Palestine, they want the control of the water, they want the control of the people, they want the land, they want the, the money for that. It's, it's all over the place. It's not all over the place. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, no, actually, uh, I might sort of switch a little bit what I was going to um, do that just to make it all come together. <laughs> um, I actually, I think that, that the, the story of sort of the Coxsackie in that area is like a, actually a, a very good um, example of sort of when you're trying to tell a story of intersectionality, like that's a, that's a perfect story about it, right? Like it's a, it's a region that's dependent on prisons for employment, prisons and um, you know fossil fuel oriented industry, um, which I, which that sort of is a, is a great picture of how um, you know how people who are poor white people are are sort of tricked into um, supporting the needs of white elites um, and just from sort of that basic benefit of being able to be employed in the prison system and also having lost all other industries that they were a part of. Um, before those industries were, were taken from them and, and replaced with extractive industries like uh, oil or, or any of the other um, any of the other ones. Um, so that's sort of what I'm going to talk mostly about um, will be about uh, sort of the prison system in the United States um, and how using um, intersectionality as a as a lens to look at that is really useful when trying to envision a world beyond the prison system. Um, so the U.S. I'm sure that most people here are aware that it incarcerates right now about two and a half million people, um, which is 25% of the world's prison population, um, and and we we're doing that while also being sort of the the global imperial power that's also engaging in wars in multiple countries, and often using some of the same tactics um, in propping up other military regimes across the planet as we do. Um, in either enforcing the rules in our prisons and also on the streets with police. Um, so, so one thing that I think is a really, a really useful way to think about um, the sort of growing prison population in the United States is to look at it as a system of domination that can be reflected in the system of domination that's being used against the global south right now. Um, and I think we talk about domestic racism 
as if it's sort of an isolated story that uh, is, and, and that we see prisons as sort of a, just kind of a pathway from slavery to the present day, um, which is an inaccurate telling of the story of prisons in the United States. Um, the, the, prisons, the prison population started to grow in the 1970s, um, not you know, from 1865 to present day. Um, for a long time, the prison population here was pretty stable at about 250,000, um, which would be sort of comparable to other nations. Um, but that changed, right? So that changed when, um, when we had sort of the passage of the Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, um, and then suddenly you have a, a new set of people who are allowed into, um, into the economy, into your universities, into sort of every area of social life legally, and now you have to find a way to mitigate that, those people being allowed into that, the people of color, black people in particular, but also uh, Latino populations, Asian populations. Um, so really the, the prison system is as a res uh, exists now as a response to that, not as just a direct reflection of slavery. Although um, in a lot of places in the country that are former slave states, prisons do look a lot like plantations, and often they are former plantations, like Angola, um, and you know prisons like that where it literally it's sort of the the people who are, who are the prison guards are on horses, they carry whips, um, you know, all those direct reflections of the slave system. But now it's more so about dealing with the people who exist in the economy as guard labor, people who aren't really um, employable, people who are sort of, either they don't have technical training or there just simply aren't jobs available for them. Um, you know, suddenly we have a place to put them in that place is prison. Um, and and we have to, I think, think about that in connection to uh, the, the militarism that we engage in globally. Like, we're also enforcing our sort of economic system, the system of capitalism in the US. Like, we're enforcing that through a militaristic police force that then puts people in prisons and keeps them there, really. And, and if they get out, they often cycle right back in. Um, and I think it's important to, to when we talk about uh, sort of militarization of police, which I think is, is right now is kind of a a buzzword that people are saying often um, it sort of erases the fact that police have a militaristic nature to them at the very beginning simply because of their history as sort of in the United States they're meant to enforce um, sort of the color line in a very 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 specific way as coming directly out of um, you know slave patrols in you know sort of in the in the 1800s in the US um, and and that that connection I think is is a really important one to make so that we don't we don't mistake when we're like sort of building our movements and, and creating our you know grand narratives about what what work we need to be doing that we don't paint a picture as if um, the policing that was going on before this new uh, wave of militarism where we have decommissioned uh, pieces of military equipment coming back to the U.S. or never leaving the U.S. and being given to police forces um, as if this is the moment what that they started to militarize and that they don't have a militaristic nature to begin with. Um, I think that 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 for me is a, is a very important um, thing to think about when you're thinking about the, the prison system that we have now and, and what we would like to move beyond. You know, and I think that, at least for myself and, and a lot of other folks, that we'd like to see a world beyond prisons, particularly in the United States beyond prisons. Um, and the only way that we can do that is if we, if we take a clear and historical picture of what, uh, what policing is in, this United, in the United States, like what the purpose, the purpose of it is. Um, and, and one place that I that I like to look to for that is uh, Angela Davis wrote a book, Our Prisons Obsolete, and that sort of tells the story of uh, prisons in the U.S. from sort of when people started to come here, uh, people from Europe started to come here versus now. So that story of prison that's a, it's meant to be a rehabilitative place where you go and reflect, um, but it was essentially the foundation is a religious one, like you go and you spend time reflecting and reading the Bible and doing hard labor, and that will help you to overcome uh, whatever you know, mistakes that you made um, that now you'll be, and then you'll be welcomed back into the world now that you've been rehabilitated. And that was a prison, those are prisons that were for white people who were also in the classes that were accepted at the time. And now we have prisons that we've corrupted that idea, and now we have prisons where the people who are in prison are dehumanized. So we have the same idea about rehabilitation and, and solitary, you know, time spent alone that's now turned into long-term solitary confinement, um, which is, you know, the UN is sort of Clear, it's clear that that's torture. Um, however, when it's a person who's dehumanized, it's a, a black or a brown body, or 
um, you know, sort of a gender non-conforming body that the prison can't categorize, um, then that person is then isolated from society and that is meant to be rehabilitative time or was meant to be rehabilitative time, but when it's a different body and a different person in that place, um, this, it's just a torture, right? It's just a sort of a system of torture that is normalized. Um, and uh, I think that the, the usefulness of putting it in the context of the global south and sort of the, the struggle for liberation that those people are engaging in is that we can then view the struggle against prisons and against violent policing as a decolonizing struggle. Um, so as a, as a struggle for people, particularly black and brown and indigenous people who live in the United States, to liberate themselves from the system of white supremacy. And that sort of as a lens um, lets people understand more clearly what sort of what you're up against, right? Like you're, when, you're, when you're thinking about um, laws that specifically target black and brown people in the U.S., um, oftentimes we can kind of get get caught up and say that oh, this is a, this is, these laws are targeting poor people or these laws are targeting, you know, um, you know these very specific populations. But, but it sort of is required to say that we're existing at a particular time with the historical context, um, and it's through that context that we can really understand what steps need to be taken to move forward. Um, and, and that sort of, to me, is, is, the, is the value of thinking about it as decolonizing, is that you have to look at the black population in the United States, Latino and indigenous population, as colonized populations, and then move from there as internal colonies existing in the United States. Um, and then move from there, and then you can look at the lessons of, of, of folks abroad who have liberated themselves, either thinking of things like, right now, the, the, uh, the sort of struggle in Kobani, or, for decolonization, or any of the um, any any of the places in Chiapas, or any places where, where folks are currently existing as liberated from the colonies that they're that they're living in, um, that's a place that you can then look to for lessons in when you're working and building the movement. Um, but I think that that to make the broader um, kind of connections that we were uh, that we're all three of us have sort of alluded to so far, I think that the one place where we can make alliances across those things, you know, because there's some, you know, these are sort of very specific things to sort of black and brown people and indigenous people in the U.S., but, like, I think one place where there is a total crossover would be in the area of surveillance. Um, the prison system is a system of mass surveillance. The slave system was a system of mass surveillance. And the standardization of schools is also a system of mass surveillance. Um, you know, so I think that, that that's one place where I'd be really interested in, and, um, Sort of further conversations about how we can use that connection as a way to build across our movements about thinking about how we can challenge the surveillance state, which is really now the global um, surveillance state, but also is very is also very specific and localized in the different areas that it's happening in. Um, but I think in, as a general theme, um, could be a useful place to to start that that kind of conversation. So yeah, I think that's.
teaching aide, you know, he's a teacher aide, he's a hall monitor, and he goes around and he's, he's talking to him, and it, it, I mean, it drives me crazy, but I can, I can see what, you know, some of these kids are pushing them, and they, you know, they're, they're, and they're trapped. They always say we don't have tracks in anymore, but they're trapped, they're trapped to not learn, and they're also closing down the trade schools. And, and I think that that's part of the reason, that they're closing down the trade schools. Well, they'll learn a trade in case or the military, one or the other. So, I mean, it's just kind of, yeah, I think, I think, I think we probably yeah, I mean, I think that that was pretty, I mean, that's pretty solid, the picture of sort of someone who's a prison guard now also a home hunter in a school, um, <laughs> and have a capsule school being the, the sort of initial problem. But I think that's also a question of like tracking and also surveillance, right? That you're, depending on the school that you're in, you may have more or less cops there, you may have metal detectors when you come in. I think that probably many of us saw stories from New York City um, from last year and the year before about schools deciding whether they were or were not going to continue using metal detectors, people coming in, whether they were or were not going to allow kids to have their phone um, while they're in school, whether they were going to like stop and frisk them on, upon entry to find out if they had their phone. Um, and that would lead to them potentially finding other things that would get you sent, you know, wherever. But even, even um, I think that the sort of story of the like, California prison system deciding whether they're going to, you know, how many prisons you're going to build based on what the third graders' test scores are is like a perfect picture of um, you know the school prison pipeline. That's quite literally the schools are. That's how they're determining how many prisons they're going to build um, because that's where they they know that that's where they're going to send them because they know the economy has no place for them. At least not the formal economy. So that's the segue between the prison and the testing that's going on. Is the testing is data gathering and then it's data, 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 data. We want all this data. And it's just and teachers have to gather all this data. And we're not teaching the kids half the time because we've got to gather data on what they're learning and what they're not learning because we can't teach them. So and, and, it, and it puts the kids in a disadvantage and we're going to have them working. Uh, Marty. You know, yeah, yeah, one thing, I don't, I don't know if I heard right, but, you, but from the civil, the end of, end of slavery too long, the, the prison, not our current prison industrial, prison industrial complex. It was the slavery by slavery by another name period. That was a, from like the end of end of Reconstruction to the end to World War II, where they just swept up black people down south for on trumped up charges and put them to work in factories for free and mines for free and stuff. And and, and possibly from the thing on people possibly in slavery, you slaves wanted to keep alive. Then you just imported more. You know, it was like it was like, and, and it's almost like we live in a society that misses slavery. You know, we want it back, you know, and then we, we find ways to replace it with something, we call it something else. We went from real to the old slavery to the slavery by the, now we've got the prison industrial complex. It's almost like that's a, that's a piece of America. Yeah. <laughs> that I mean, America doesn't want to let go right, of. Like technical you know, slavery is not outlawed. They gotta find a way, that, a way to, um, uh, to um, exploit, you know, um, people of color especially. Yeah, yeah. Slavery is legal in the Constitution, like, if you commit Yeah, exactly, so, exactly. So, you know, you're, you're, the loop, so the, the, the loophole, the the loop of your prime used to be not, not having any money or not having a place to live. Ah, you're <laughs> vagrancy, you know, and, and they, would, they, would, they would sweep you up in the old chain gang and, and the, um, and actually they, they actually rented people out to factories and, and mines and stuff, and that's how, like Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama, they had um, convicts running their mines and factories and stuff and, and doing their work for for, for for no money at all, you know. Um, so so it's almost like a, a piece of America that America wants back in one way or another. Um, uh, Any questions, uh, Michael? Yeah, I wanted to. I mean, uh, on a little bit of, of the background for what Marty was just describing, uh, when the uh, amendment to the Constitution was passed after the Civil War, uh, outlawed slavery, it said that no one shall be compelled to work without pay uh, except as punishment for a legal offense. And that was part of the deal by which they got that amendment passed. And that, it was immediately used <coughs> by creating 
trumped up charges which were enforced only on black people. Uh, and thereby they could do what Marty was just describing, to put them in prison and then to rent them out uh, to industrialists to run their mines or their uh, dangerous uh, occupations. Uh, it's a win-win solution. Uh, so are you saying that was the plan? Uh, that was the, the plan? That was the plan? It appears to it's hard to say because it was it was a compromise between southerners and northerners in passing that amendment. And maybe on paper it sounded reasonable. You know, can you commit the crime? You have to pay back. You know. Yeah, but but the crime, but, you, but, the, but, but then what was the crime? <laughs> I have to tell you where I learned this. Uh, I've been going for a number of years to the. Uh, annual events of the, uh, uh, the Underground Railroad uh, uh, History Project. And one workshop that I went to uh, explained that very thing. It really opened my eyes to uh, the malice of forethought in uh, formulating it in that particular it, I think a lot of things got to be through a wink and a nod and an understanding. It's not really put in print for everyone to see the thinking behind it. Is. But I remember, you know, we probably have heard of chain gangs, and they were common in the South, and the, the county would use them to clean up the roads or do whatever. And as you said, they actually were able to rent them to uh, businesses or farms for migrant workers. Uh, so there, there was that sort of thing. And I was saying they probably didn't, uh, well, education. Uh, teaching slaves to read was not allowed originally uh, because we still want them to be educated. Educated people can be problematic. Um, I gather you're a teacher or in the school, probably a no, member no. of the union. I am a member of the union. And the people who get to be in charter schools may not be so able to be a member of a union. And teachers are a large union block. There are not many union blocks left in North America. So that's another reason to target, to, to discredit schools, and, and, I and to construct a measurement system that makes them look bad. Yeah. And as a former teacher, I know that I can make a test that every kid will fail if I want them to. I don't want them to, of course. But when you have another agenda, I mean, I think, you know, generally speaking, I mean, most Americans, and I'm probably most people in the world, but specifically talking about America, um, most of us, whether we're, you know, political or just so-called average American citizen, is under some degree of surveillance, as we've seen by like, the 
Snowden leaks and all these other things that have been coming out, you know, government surveillance of emails and phone calls and things like that. Um, on a more specific level, um, you look at, again, political activists, people engaged in completely legitimate, nonviolent dissent being, um, you know, subjected to everything from, you know, FBI agents trying to infiltrate activist groups or, you know, definitely being placed on, you know, multiple Homeland Security watch lists or things like that. You can go back to the COINTELPRO days where, you know, the government was trying extremely hard to sabotage people and ruin people's lives, scare them out of, you know, being politically engaged. Um, one community that I'm, again, kind of aware of is happening, I don't, I, I'm not Muslim, but I do work with um, a group called Muslim Solidarity Committee and Project Salam. And so that's really helped me become aware of how post 9-11, um, the government has engaged in extreme amounts of surveillance against basically the entire Muslim community, whether it's you know sending NYPD officers to infiltrate mosques for no legitimate reason other than the fact that they're a mosque, or um, again, just trying to <coughs> approach random Muslims and try to kind of you know push them into becoming informants within their own community um, and using, trying to get them to engage in surveillance against their own religious, um, you know, religious families, religious communities, things like that. Um, and then again, on a more international level, um, I think it's some of these same security companies, like something like, um, I don't know, like Strapper, that, you know, helps with, uh, you know, surveillance here, but is also being used to spy on, you know, political activists and general populations overseas, and you have the collaboration between the NSA with things like the British version, which is the the GHQ and things like that. Um, so I think it's really just at this point, most people in the world and in America are under some degree of surveillance. It just really is probably like some more than others. Like again, like more who are politically inclined or people who are minorities, religious minorities, or live in certain areas. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely, um, I agree with all that, and I think that that beyond that, um, folks who are formerly incarcerated who are out on either public probation or also, you know, experiencing surveillance in a very specific way where they have to report their activities and, um, you know, sort of curtail their activities based upon the requirements of that surveillance. Um, but I think in terms of just like on a, like in a, in a, on a more like personal, interpersonal level in terms of conversation and like whether this has been engaged, um, I think that at this point now, every, you know, every person is aware that some, that some level of surveillance is going on. Um, and I think I'm actually, like, I'm, this is something that I'm relatively recently interested in, in terms of, like, actually bringing that conversation into the, at least into the sort of anti-mass incarceration um, community here, and trying to talk about, you know, what the implications are of this, of this level of, like, global surveillance, which is, uh, you know, which is, you know, that's another, that's basically another panel, but, like, essentially the entire internet is tapped at this point, so anything that you do on the internet, um, you know, they can access, or anything you can do over your phone, um, they can access. So like thinking about what implications that has for our movements, um, you know, is, is an important conversation I think that just locally we, we need to have. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a comment then, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, One of the things, you know, I've been involved in the actual world movement for many, many years, and was a full-time worker and it was clear the movements back then affected each other. The civil rights movement really um, taught people in the war movements uh, tactics and what to do with it. The war movement fed into the women's movement, the women's movement, the other gay movement, the rights movement. But they were separate. Um, and, you know, today's movements were learning about intersectionality, we're learning about, it seems very clear how to connect the dots. And so when UNAP was formed in 1910, 1910, 2010, <laughs> 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 a conference here in, in Albany, we did. I heard that anniversary conference, right? That's right. We did um, 
we, we talked about the wars abroad, but also the wars at home. And at that point, what we saw very clearly was when they were talking about a war on terror, which was, first of all, wars are different now. They're, they're not, you know, like World War I and World War II, where there were a lot of like, fighting each other. They're against third world armies, first of all. But we started uh, seeing the attacks on Muslims happening, and Baldwin was one of the places where it happened, and which is one of the reasons why the conference was called here. And at the end of that conference, we had a march from the conference at a downtown hotel to the Central Avenue Mosque, where we had a rally. And, you know, in our minds, that was very symbolic of the anti war movement coming to the Muslim community, which was under attack for the same reasons, attack, war on terror, and, um, uh, and making those connections. And, uh, so that's where we saw the war at home. But very, very quickly, it became very clear that this was a much bigger war than just on the Muslim community. Uh, first of all, blacks have always been attacked in this country, but it accelerated also after 9-11. We started seeing more things like stopping first in the militarization of the police, and, uh, shooting people at will, and uh, getting off on, on the streets, and, and so forth. And as we took up those issues, what we discovered was UNAC was becoming more Muslim and more black. Um, and today, there are major national um, uh, black organizations which are part of UNAC. Um, and if you come to our conference in May, it's a commercial. <laughs> Uh, down the Seacock in New Jersey, right outside of New York, you'll see a panel of parents of kids that have been killed by cops uh, there. You'll see a very diverse uh, group of, of uh, people there because some of these issues are very clear. And when the environmental movements also get clear with these bomb trains, which is first of all an environmental justice issue, because they tend to be in minority neighborhoods, but they are here. But they're also Wars are resource wars. They're oil wars, and they're sending these pipelines and sending it over to you know, Europe to undercut Russia and the stuff that's going on in, in the Ukraine and, and, and so forth. Um, and the fossil fuel industry is, is driving the war industry. And so much of this, very much connected to er everything, from prisons to austerity programs. Our economy would collapse without the military-industrial complex and the prison-industrial complex. Economy would collapse. The capitalist economy in this country cannot support itself without those things. There's real major connections. And that's one of the things we hope to bring together at this UNAC conference, and also one of the reasons why we try to put it out this forum tonight, so that we all can start understanding that and broadening our, our concepts. If you're an anti war activist, you have to be an anti racist activist. You have to be uh, you know, in support of gay rights. You have to be in support of civil liberties of everybody and against surveillance and, and against mass incarceration and on and on. You can't just be isolated in your own room right now. It becomes a structure of movement as a whole. And so that's just what I uh, what, what think about it, what I think we're going to start. So Bethlehem for Neighbors for Peace, for instance, was involved in all the rallies for to be in a culture that's pretty dysfunctional. And uh, I, I try to figure out what, where it starts. And uh, I, I trace it right back to the, uh, the Bible. King Solomon said that he who trusted in his own heart is a fool. And the fool is just is driven out of the child with a rod. And his own son, who probably brought up with uh, his, his thing, a completely dysfunctional king, who almost got killed for being so dysfunctional. And 12 of the, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel revolted against them. And then later on, we have um, like Eric Erickson saying we have to wipe out the entire Native American culture because they bring up their children to independent thinking. And they don't compete with each other, and they won't fit into our cultures. We'll have to dismiss them entirely. Then I have James D. Watson telling mothers to uh, withhold mother love from the child because it's a dangerous thing. will destroy their lives. Don't, don't fondle them. Don't kiss them. Just treat them like little business people. And then uh, when um, Dr. Benjamin Spock wrote his book, 
took 20 years before the Nixon administration realized how horrible it was. And Norman Vincent Peale came out and said that Dr. Benjamin Spock committed the most heinous crime in the history of the human race. That was a quote. And uh, he said for feeding them when they were hungry and, and for giving into all their needs and stuff like that. And, and every report on violence in the United States said time and time again, if you treat the children well in early childhood, the violence all goes away. And that's about the last thing we do. And of course, the school system, uh, I was, as a, a little young kid at four years old, I wanted to get into the woods by myself. I knew my parents weren't really into the woods or into their own minds. I just wanted to get in the woods myself. I, my parents told me to never cross the road. I figured I could go across the road. Plenty of time. You know, I could see a car, you know, I like to cross the road. So I went to the woods by myself at four years old. My mother beat me up and dad beat me to that. But kids are born with a universal feeling. They don't have any discrimination. What we have, what we finally enculturate this, this culture, is a person has no sense of self. He has to accumulate material possessions. He has to compete. He has to have idols and stuff like that. And, and he has to have all this self-hate engendered in him because of all this, this, this way we're brought up, and we have to project that self-hate. Now, there's a great science fiction novel about when the Martians came to the Earth, and this black man said to his other friend, said, now we got someone to discriminate against. It's sort of like, the, it always has to be somebody you have to destroy. And of course, most people pick on children. The worst thing to say, oh, you're acting like a woman, or, oh, no, you're really acting like baby, you know. That's like the lowest of the totem pole. But my, my point is that once we as a culture realize our, our children are very sacred, stop treating them the way we treat them in the hospitals, bring them into this world with complete understanding that this is a sacred place in this world, you are a sacred person, and, um, and we're going to transform this world fast. And that's my, my little piece. And I'm going to Colorado because I've been asked by my stepdaughter to help raise her two kids. She's seven to ten years old, and uh, I'm thinking of giving them shiny lights. Hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was interested in the point about um, surveillance being an issue that cuts across a lot of groups and a lot of issues. Um, and I think that um, keeping Person to person means of communication and means of communication that don't depend on the internet is valuable for organizations um, because I've always felt that at some point the Department of Defense created the internet, the Department of Defense can close it down. And um, I was wondering if anybody had any thoughts on that in terms of the um, the other types of structures that, you could, that could be set up that are less easy to surveil. I mean, any, anything can really be surveilled if they want to do it by having human infiltrators and so forth. But, um, the degree to which um, you know encrypt encryptation works or alternate means of communication that don't depend on the internet and things of that nature. Uh, um, I actually just this weekend um, had a retreat here in town for an organization, organization for free society that I'm a part of, um, and we had a we had a workshop basically about um, uh, secure communications and like the ways that we can secure our computer-based communications, but also just thinking about like how we need to stop, like not stop depending on um, computer-based communication, because essentially what we what we were trained in and what actually we'll we'll be offering that soon for uh, a sort of a workshop for people if they want to come to that, and I'll share that when it when it happens um, for these this uh, system that's called Tails, which is basically you plug it into a computer and it doesn't it's not Windows or any or like Mac or whatever, it's just a system that's entirely encrypted. Um, and you can you plug it in and you can access the internet through this thing called Tor, um, which is the onion router, which is an alternative um, internet basically where it's it's <coughs> regular internet, but it basically bounces your signal, so it can't you can't tell the location that you're in um, when you log on. And it's <coughs> just to have secure chats, secure you can sort of have secure emails, all those different things. Um, but one of the sort of <laughs> most important points that were ma was made by um, uh, the person who was giving the workshop was basically that like. The, the so this it was rooted in the story of Frederick Douglass about like the, the way that uh, he taught himself how to read and write and how that is actually sort of the the most liberating thing that you can do is actually keeping your keeping your own communications like writing your notes down for your meeting passing them around not 
relying so much on the phone or on the computer and focusing more on the person-to-person -person interaction, um, like sort of the teaching of teaching a lot of different people to read once you teach yourself how to read. Um, so trying to focus on what we know to be secure, which is something on paper and person-to-person and -person contact rather than like trying to use technologies outside of paper and pen. Like what's what's scarier, the fact that the government might be watching what I'm saying, or what could happen if people stop speaking out? You know what I mean? And I think that's something that a choice everyone has to make for themselves. But I definitely agree also, like she said, just especially among the younger generation, everyone wants the technology and instant messenger and all these different social media, which is good and useful, especially if you're communicating with people who live out of state. But if you have the opportunity to sit down and have these conversations with people one-on-one, -on -one. not only is it more, you know, secure, but I feel like you really just get that extra human connection that a lot of us, again, especially among I feel, my generation, we don't have as much, and I think that if you're really trying to build with people, it's just so much more powerful if you can just, like, sit down and talk. Um, or, again, you can just handwriting something is more personal than just typing that. We used to think of it as more powerful if the government thought, if you thought the government was watching you all the time, you know? And I used to say, well, they have to put an, then they can put an agent behind every tree and watch me all the time. Well, I didn't think they'd actually do that. <laughs> you know, I was joking, <laughs> you know, that they, they would. But, the, but they have so much information now that, seriously, and, and, and if, you, if it causes you to not communicate with each other, you paranoid then they, they have basically one you know they, they got you you know so so screw them you know they, they want to read my stuff you know or you know i'm um, at the point where i want to just touch on what you were saying about the, the human the human touch the human reaction to this stuff too it's so many times i don't know how many people on listeners or students where you do a lot of discovery on listeners and some and nuances are so lost and people get offended yeah. people say things and it's like that's not what I meant, but by the time you get there, you, you wrote something in the morning, by the time you get home, there's been this whole discussion about all this stuff, and it's it's so, it's so non, I mean, telephones are better, I mean, conference calls are better, but it's still, the one-on-one, -on -one, I'm trying to get people to connect, and it's, it's kind of like you don't want to do everything Mindy and in my own backyard, and that's it, but sometimes the local connections are just, we gotta got keep connecting with the guy as much as we possibly Well, and Joseph was saying, the, um, you saw the movie Citizen Four, um, Edward Snowden had his book on his bed called Homeland by Cory Doctorow. And that's the sequel to Little Brother, and both books are about these high schoolers who are heavily surveilled, and the, there's a, basically a workshop how to set up a, a, a security uh, computer system and how to uh, beat all the surveillance systems. So it's a fascinating series of books there he wrote. And every student was actually reading them in uh, Hong Kong, according to the documentary. Um, Leslie, I was just listening to the, to the conversation and the, the word dehumanization. To me, one of the strongest components of this intersectionality, the biggest weapon, I think, is the dehumanization of groups, of races, of religions, of individual children. Um, everything uh, gets stamped with the same with, with, a, with a label, and the the individuality, the individual human beings that comprise this world, we're all being shoved into a box. And um, I, I think it's been a fascinating book. I think all of you. It's really very important. And if I can just bring up this one other little thing. 
Um, because I've been hearing a lot about it the past couple of days, and it's about this jihadi John who has been beheading people, the British Muslim. Mm -hmm. You all know about yeah. jihadi John? No? Yeah. Okay. Um, so they've been talking about it on Democracy Now! and um, it's been in the news a lot, but he apparently, um, in the mid-2000s, was being interviewed on, on um, British TV by some person. Anyway, um, he was a very compassionate, kind, sensitive young man, and he was talking about uh, the terrible effects of 9-11 and the London train bombing and how awful it was that innocent human lives were taken. He was surveilled, and he was, and they were trying to entrap him to become an informant. And they totally dehumanized him, and now he's chopping people's heads off. But this whole system is so barbaric. Anyway, not, I'm not condoning what he's doing. Obviously, what he's doing is horrific. But it's so easy, apparently, to take someone who's vulnerable and completely turn them into what we might call a monster. But there are many. They destroyed his life. Yeah, it's not like this happened in a vacuum. It didn't you know? And the media makes it seem like, oh, this guy just came out of nowhere. No, and like, no, oh, it's there's very no context. Yeah, it's whatsoever. very interesting to hear his history and, and, and the surveillance. And then they got to his fiance, and his fiance broke off with the marriage. And uh, just they just kept making his world smaller and smaller and trying to get him to become, you know, uh, a spy against his friends and family members. And, he wouldn't do it, and so now this is what we've got. You know, this is just one example of the dehumanization process. Anyway. Joe? Yeah, just a couple of things. I think we should do everything we can do to protect our conversations and internet and so forth, but I also think it's not going to work. Uh, you know, because um, uh, I lived through a period when we didn't communicate that way, and when we wanted to advertise something, we turned it out on a mimeograph machine. Um, and uh, we did do a lot more face-to-face -face stuff. And they had something back then called COINTELPRO. And we discovered from COINTELPRO that they were in all of our organizations and they were behind every tree. They were hiring kids in college to go to anti-war meetings so they could keep notes and put it put on them and so forth. I eventually got my own um, uh, FBI files, and I had a huge FBI file. They broke into my house at one point. They forgot to wipe that out. Um, I, got, I got my father's uh, files, which were huge. Um, and reading through them, I see they spoke to his five-year-old son, an FBI agent. I was the five-year-old son. I don't remember an FBI agent speaking to me, but they did that. They find out what they want to find out. They have the means to do that anyway, and the technology maybe makes it easier, but they'll do it um, any way uh, they can. And just on Jihadi John, or whatever his name is, uh, it's not clear that that's the same person. Even the, uh, on Democracy Now!, the, the group that had worked with him, the guy said, well, I'm not sure that it really is the same person. Uh, I, I don't believe anything that comes out of the government or any of these people. Uh, they they lie, uh, you know. They, they exist in a different um, paradigm. We do lie about everything, and it's terrible if anybody cuts off someone's heads. But it doesn't seem so terrible when Saudi Arabia does it, you know, pretty much daily for yeah, like things like having around. drugs or converting from uh, Muslim to non-Muslim or something called blasphemy, which is whatever the hell they want to make that, oh. or driving. Oh or driving on a car when you're a woman or something of that sort, you know? Um, so uh, this whole conversation around that person and so forth is one of these other conversations to make you think <coughs> that Muslims are terrible and justify war and justify all the kinds of shit that we've been talking about, surveillance and all that kind of stuff. So I, I give no cre credence to any of that, that stuff. I, I, there's a lot of people who even think a lot of that was just falsified what you saw on the TVs and couldn't really quite believe it because it didn't look right. They, they, you know, they, they talked about it. So uh, this is a government that lies. You should always remember that. And the British government, too. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, anyone else? Any last words? David? Yeah.
from yeah. the very beginning. Well, at least a, a junior version of that, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had students just ask me today, yeah. you know, one kid was being a jerk. Mm -hmm. And he said, husband, don't you just want to hit him? Come on, tell us. Don't you just want to hit him? And I'm like, no, not really. But I mean, it, you know, that it, it's in their mindset that there's, that there's a solution or, you know, whatever. He's being, he's bullying you or whatever. I mean, yeah. it's just, and, and sometimes then, they're going to go home and they, and they might feel sad when they cry about it. They're like, oh, don't be a pussy or whatever. Right, yeah, exactly. Like, you don't be a pussy. You're a pussy. And then, like, you know, I get then. Right. Now, and that first, yeah. what happened? Oh, yeah. we don't know. What does that happen? Well, no. <laughs> not really. Yeah. No, and there's no context yeah. provided ever to these situations. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else?